Welcome to the age of gold. We are now at the end of the 19th century and word is spreading quickly about yet another tale of gold. This time, however, it would be in northern Canada in what would soon become the Yukon Territory. It was said that gold literally flowed through the rivers of this region. All you had to do was just grab it. 100,000 people eventually joined the Stampede North, most of them not even ever arriving. It was, after all, the last great gold rush for a reason. So now we are in 1896. The economy of the US is not great. Unemployment was high. Some early prospectors had returned to San Francisco and Seattle that year and brought with them tremendous amounts of gold and wealth. Obviously, this caught a lot of people's attention, including the press, who reported on the tremendous amount of gold these prospectors brought back from the Klondike. Word spreads all over the western seaboard of the US. Given the weak economy of the time, many people decided to try their luck up north, find some gold, and live the rest of their lives as a rich man. This perfect storm created the perfect condition for a stampede to the Yukon. Like investors trying to buy the same hot stock, 100,000 individuals eventually decided to make the journey by the summer of 1898. The majority at around 70 to 80% were Americans, departing from either San Francisco or Seattle, none of them having mining experience of course. What is even more surprising is that only a fraction of them actually arrived. It is estimated that only between 30,000 and 40,000 of those prospectors actually set foot in the Klondike. Remember, this is the late 19th century. There was no real roads or any infrastructure in the Canadian Arctic. In fact, these lands had just been discovered, quote unquote, by Europeans about half a century ago. So the journey was a treacherous one, and most would either abandon or perish along the way. An aspiring prospector did have, however, multiple routes to choose from. Assuming this prospector is American, he would first need to travel to Seattle. From there, prospectors would board an overcrowded ship destined to Vancouver or Victoria for custom purposes and to claim a license. The Canadian government did have a set of rules which forced prospectors to bring a year's worth of food and other supplies. From Vancouver, Victoria, the routes would split. For a heftier price, a prospector could take the all water route, which crossed the Pacific Ocean to the Yukon River Delta. From there, they would sail on a river boat upstream all the way to Dawson. This route, however, was considered to be the rich man's route, as it was both faster and avoided any overland travel, but came at a heftier price. A cheaper and much more popular route was the Skagway slash Dia routes. Instead of sailing the Pacific, the ship would sail north along the islands of British Columbia and Alaska until it reached the Alaskan port towns of Skagway or Dia. These two towns were neighbors but were the trailheads of two major trails linking to the Yukon River system, the White Pass and the Chilkook Trail. Both trails eventually connected to Lake Burnett, a lake that drains out of the Yukon River system. These trails were, however, very, very treacherous. Due to the excessive volume, these trails would get incredibly muddy and even unpassable in the case of the White Trail during summers. The Chilcook Trail was more widely used and even had makeshift infrastructure like a staircase cut into the ice and a horse-powered freight carrying rope for a particularly steep part of the trail. Remember that prospectors were obligated to bring supplies, including a year's worth of food. Therefore, they had to do this trail journey in multiple sections, each time making round trips until they had brought all their belongings. In total, a prospector would need around 30 round trips, a total of about 4,000 kilometers before he had moved all his supplies to the end of the trail. From Bennett's Lake, prospectors would build makeshift rafts to sail downstream all the way to Dawson City. The final route we will mention today is the All-Canadian Route, which, as the name suggests, avoids crossing into the United States. 
This route, for obvious reason, was only popular with Canadian prospectors. Starting from Edmonton, the route would follow a select few rivers, cross through the Canadian wilderness of northern Alberta and British Columbia, and eventually reach the Pelly River, a river that is part of the Yukon River system. Other all-Canadian routes did exist, however they were not very popular and few trekked these ambitious expeditions. Now to me, the fact that tens of thousands of people were actually doing this incredible journey is actually insane. It's kind of like a testament to the lengths at which people will actually go to obtain wealth or especially this quick wealth. Obviously with the arrival of tens of thousands of new prospectors in the region, new towns began to sprung up all along these routes. And the most famous of them and the center of the gold rush was Dawson City. And Dawson City was actually founded in 1996 because of the gold rush. Check out this chart showing Dawson City's population from its foundation in 1896 until 2021. We can see extreme growth in the late 1890s, reaching a peak of around 30,000 in 1898. 1898 also marks the year in which the territory of Yukon was created to bring governance to the booming area and Dawson City was named as its capital a title that was kept until 1953 when it was transferred to Whitehorse. By 1899, the gold rush is over and marks the beginning of extreme depopulation. In the 1901 census, the first census in which Yukon was a part of, Dawson City had already declined to 9,142 and by 1921 had declined below the 1,000 mark. And by this point, the smaller ramshack towns around Dawson City, like Klondike City, were completely abandoned. The last census in 2021 indicated a population of just 1,577. Skagway had a similar fate than Dawson. Being the entry point of the gold rush, Skagway became the largest city in Alaska when it peaked at around 10,000 in 1898. It then embarked on a sudden decline in which the population dropped below the 1,000 mark during the first decade of the 20th century. Now these are quite incredible growth and quite incredible declines uh, if you ask me. In the case of Dawson City, obviously as we've just seen in the graph, it was never able to recover from the gold rush and kind of fell into irrelevance, especially when the Alaskan highway was built and it completely bypassed the city. These insane demographics also tell us a story about the boom and bust nature of gold rushes. Now, like this was a crazy bonanza of extravagance, extreme growth, and tens of thousands of people all wanting to get wealthy quickly. And by 1998, it had become quite obvious to most prospectors that the fantasy that was fed to them back home was just a complete lie. The easy gold that did exist in the Klondike, and there was gold that literally flowed through the rivers. However, that gold was already taken by the early prospectors. And if you were a later prospector, say you arrived in 1898, even finding a mining plot was kind of a difficult thing to do. So most people who arrived late they kind of realized their situation and they just kind of went back home. At the end, a handful of the 30,000 prospectors who even made it to the Klondike actually struck it rich. And of those who did strike it rich, they usually just squandered their entire wealth on Dawson City's extravagant entertainment scene. They usually just kind of wasted it all on gambling, copious consumption, uh, Dawson City was even internationally known for having, you know, some of the best saloons and some of the best prostitution houses in even like North America. The only ones who did manage to somewhat prosper during the gold rush were kind of like the entrepreneurial spirited individuals who came to the Klondike to essentially sell equipment, sell food, services, whatever to the prospectors. But even those guys eventually fell into the corruptive nature of the Klondike 
And most of them, like the prospectors, you know, just gambled their wealth away and kind of left with nothing. All right, so quickly before we wrap up this video, I just wanna show you guys what Dawson City uh, looks like in modern times. So we can see that the city itself is still intact and we can see that it still has a 19th century vibe to it with the grid city. But I also wanna show you guys that Dawson City still has quite the mining industry uh, even today. You can see along the whole Klondike River here that obviously there's a lot of mining activity going on. You can see there's a lot of deformations along the rivers and that is just, just that is just an indication that a lot of gold mining is still going on today. And the same thing for the little Bonanza Creek that goes down this way. You can see that there's obviously some some type of extraction industry going on along the whole uh, creek all the way down here. So yeah, so Dawson City still has a gold mining scene. And this, you can even see like, this is where uh, the Klondike city was. And you can see that it's completely abandoned. And uh, yeah. And if we take a look um, into the city itself, uh, we can see that it still retains its very distinctive gold rushy style. I'll just take a look at a random street here. So yeah, you can see, obviously it has a very distinctive look uh, to it. And it's a, it's a pretty cool town uh, to go visit if you ever have the chance to go to the Yukon. But uh, yeah, just to show that it's still, like it's still a very historical feeling city. So to me, that is really, really cool. Uh, it's cool that they kept this, this style uh, within the city. So that is it for today's video. I hope you learned something new on the Klondike Gold Rush. It's kind of a sad story really about, you know, all these people going there to have the, this quick wealth and change their lives, but in the end kind of come out with nothing. And it's also kind of a story about human nature and how if you do attain this quick wealth, uh, lots of people often fall into, you know, corrupted behaviors and kind of lose it all. So yeah, if you've enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like and even subscribing to the channel. And uh, I'll see you next time. Ciao guys.